basically there was a, a handful of actors that could be billed out. They always think that the next recession is going to end up being like the previous one before it, uh, but it ends up being, you know, basically imploding from another area. Some people thought that our financial system sat atop a house of cards before COVID hit. Uh, so our first question to you is, is our is our global financial system in a precarious position right now? Uh, in a sense. I mean, it depends on what parts you're looking at. I, I would say it was in a more precarious position uh, right back before the great financial crisis. Uh, and that's where we saw a lot of the kind of the internal bailouts happening there. Uh, because if you look at, for example, how much bank reserves you know banks had relative to their liabilities, uh, that's actually you know when they hit an all-time low. Since then, they've been a lot higher. Uh, so it's kind of like the core banking system's already been bailed out. Uh, but now we have kind of a more broad kind of social issue, wealth concentration, high debt levels, all sorts of things like that. And so in many ways, what happened uh, you know about 12 years ago mirrored a lot what happened in the early 1930s uh, after the you know the famous 1929 crash. Uh, whereas kind of the environment we're going in now, uh, looks a lot more like the 1940s, you know, hopefully without, you know, the, the war that they had, uh, but the, basically in terms of a fiscal environment, like a massive kind of spending environment and kind of a, a broader bailout of society. And that, so, so that, that kind of one-two punch of kind of a, a private debt bubble and banking crisis followed by like a, a, a public uh, debt bubble. And, you know, that tends to be more inflationary. But then aside from that, we also have, for example, the, the way the global monetary system is constructed, that's a whole nother beast entirely. And so, you know, if you go back before 44, you had, you know, a variety of different gold standards. Uh, and then from 1944 to 1971, you had the Bretton Woods system that eventually broke down uh, in the late 60s and, and you know, kind of officially broke in 1971. And then since then, we've been on the petrodollar system and signs are starting to show that the petrodollar system is starting to, you know, basically fall apart as well. Uh, and so that's somewhat different than the debt problem. Uh, but, it, you know, it's all kind of comes to a head probably here, you know, over the next 10 years as we sort some of this out. So does that mean to say that you actually thought that the financial system was more precarious before the 08 crisis and the 08 crisis reset ourselves to to some degree and we're actually perhaps in a better place than we were uh, pre-2008? I think it depends on which part of the system you're looking at. And so, for example, in terms of the way the global monetary system is constructed, so, uh, you know, the whole way that the international countries do trade with each other and what currency they use, that's in a worse state than it was 12 years ago. However, if you look at, for example, the domestic U.S. banking system, uh, it's more capitalized than it was back then. And it's because it basically imploded about 12 years ago. And due to those bailouts, it's at a much higher level of capitalization now. And so by that particular metric, uh, it's far less fragile. And that's why, for example, in this crisis, despite the fact that this was a much bigger economic impact, we haven't seen a lot of bank failures like we saw back then, because that was specifically a banking failure, uh, whereas this is a broader uh, solvency issue. Uh, so it really depends on what what aspect you're looking at. This broader solvency issue that you're talking about, where we we start to get into kind of like what is money and re reserve currency status and that sort of thing, is it a, whole, a harder problem to solve, like more difficult than what we faced in 2008? Uh, yeah, I think so because you know what we faced in 2008. Uh, basically, there was a, a handful of actors that could be bailed out. And of course, there are all sorts of issues like that. We saw Occupy Wall Street and other sort of kind of uh, pushback against that because, you know, you had people lose their homes and they, you know, they did generally didn't get bailed out. But then you had the banks that, you know, were going to lose their homes, but they, they're the ones that often got bailed out. And so, but in terms of basically how they capitalize the system, uh, that's an easier problem to fix. Uh, whereas how to, uh, you know, basically restructure society is a much harder problem. And if you go, you know, if you go back in history, uh, the, you know, after you get the banking crisis, that later part actually tends to be the hardest part. And so that's kind of where we are in the cycle. And it, you know, it feels a lot different. So a lot of people, you know, they fight the last battle. So they, you know, they always think that the next recession is going to end up being like the previous one before it, uh, but it ends up being, you know, basically imploding from another area. And so rather than having another banking crisis this time, we had, you know, a much different area was impacted. It was the, it was not the, you know, the leverage in the bank system that was the issue. It was some of these other broader trends. So, so many people, and perhaps we could call them doomers, um, if, if some people would call them doomers, think that uh, there was going to be some sort of event 
uh, pre, again, pre-COVID, that would destabilize the global financial system. And it doesn't matter what that event was, uh, and it was going to create this a financial crisis, no matter what the actual pre-crisis was. And so now with COVID, we are seeing that there, there is a health crisis. I have re- read some of your writing that you do believe that we are in a very transition, uh, a, a phase, a phase change, a transition uh, period where we are going from uh, a one, one spot to, to the next. What are you seeing ahead of us that we are transitioning into? And what are kind of the, the macro forces behind that transition? I think, you know, kind of the main crux of it is that in the 2020s, I expect a significant currency devaluation uh, because we're at the point now where, uh, you know, you know, if you look back, for example, in the 90s, you know, they, they, you had the implosion of long-term capital management. You know, basically, you had you know systemic issues among hedge funds, and they, they you know, basically, you had a, a bailout of that. You kind of kicked it up a, a level. Then you had the equity bubble uh, in the late 90s, right after that, uh, and of course, when that you know imploded, they they cut interest rates and they kind of kicked that up to the housing level. Uh, and then when that all blew up, uh, that's when they 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 transferred the leverage to the the sovereign level. And so at that point, it doesn't really have any further to go other than a currency devaluation. And so that's generally what you see at this stage in the cycle. And there's a couple of ways to accomplish that. I mean, they, you know, basically they can run massive fiscal deficits. The central bank buys a lot of the bonds to finance those deficits. And then if interest rates try to rise to compensate for any inflation that can happen, they can potentially lock yields below the inflation rate. And even right now, for example, at the treasury markets, you know, pricing in 2% inflation uh, but the yields are like one percent, and so you, anyone holding treasuries is currently, you know, slowly losing purchasing power. And of course, there's different ways to measure inflation, so it could be faster than that. Uh, so, and that was somewhat different than we saw back in the 2010s decade. That was a more disinflationary decade uh, because you didn't see a broad, in, you didn't see a rapid increase in the broad money supply. Uh, instead, you saw a rapid increase in in bank reserves, which are more about ca- capitalizing the bank system under the surface. Uh, whereas now you're seeing it at a, at a you know broad money supply. So the amount of currency in circulation, the amount of currency that people hold and you know in in deposits and banks, that's all rising rapidly, which is a somewhat more inflationary outcome. Uh, but of course, we also have this big deflationary shock in the form of people. You know, they're not traveling, they're not spending on things, and so you know we're kind of held up in our homes right now still to some extent. Uh, but you know, as you look out, you know, deeper in the 2020s, uh, we kind of have are at the situation now where we have structural fiscal deficits in many places of the world and high sovereign debts uh, that can't support positive real yields. And so, people all around the world have a store of value problem. Uh, and then there's there's deeper issues for some emerging markets, and you know, uh, you know, the way that energy priced around the world, uh, because we have kind of these dynamics of of the global reserve, you know, petrodollar system that's starting to kind of have issues around the corner. And the main issue there is that, for example, all these foreign countries have dollar-dominated debts. Uh, and that, so whenever they can't get dollars, you have a problem. Uh, but in addition, the U.S. banking system, uh, you know, uh, even though they were well capitalized, uh, they ran into issues back in 2019 uh, because there was such an oversupply of U.S. treasuries that they were basically forced to buy. And so I think if you look at, say, doom and gloomers, they're always talking about a crisis around the corner. I think one of the key things you have to take into account policy response that happens. And so, for example, uh, you know, some of the more sophisticated analysts say, here's a problem, and that's why we expect a response to happen. And so, for example, uh, there were starting to be a lot of uh, signs of financial stress under the surface in the U.S. banking system in 2019, and that eventually manifested itself with a, a spike in the repo rate in, in, in September 2019. And for people that don't know what that means, that's basically an overnight lending rate between banks, and it just kind of sprung a leak and literally tripled overnight. And so the Federal Reserve had to come in, they ended quantitative tightening, and they started doing quantitative easing and basically expanding their balance sheet again to push that leak back down. And then, of course, in early 2020, we had a much bigger issue. And if you look at, you know, of course, we had all the COVID stuff, we had the shutdown, we had this, you know, massive uh, thing happening. But if, for people that were following bank liquidity, uh, you know, following kind of, you know, some of the financial markets, you know, behind the stock market, the actual kind of debt markets and stuff, uh, what you had happen was, you had the scramble to, uh, for foreigners to get dollars to service those dollar dominant debts. And in order to, to get those, many of them had to sell treasuries, right? So you have foreign exchange reserves all around the world that hold treasuries. And so they started selling some treasuries in order to get dollars, uh, but that rendered the entire US treasury market illiquid. And so the Federal Reserve had to come in and buy a trillion dollars worth of treasuries in three weeks and basically <laughs> reliquify it. And so you can read all the, the, the Federal Reserve like meeting minutes. I mean, they had emergency meetings to try to you know, stop this. Uh, and I think I just basically think that one of the main issues that people have, you know, in terms of doom and gloom, is that you always have to take into account the policy response. So that basically left unaddressed 
was a doom and gloom scenario, but then you have to take into account what happens when it is printed trillion dollars. And that, that opens up, of course, its own set of issues, uh, but it's not the initial crash. It's what, it's what happens later. And that's why whenever you have these kind of deflationary debt-based shocks, instead, what, you know, instead of all kind of unraveling like a house of cards, usually you get an inflationary response, and then it usually kind of grinds itself out through inflation you know, later in time. 